There's a repo on GitHub. Uh, the link will be, it's on the setup document that got shared around, but it's also easy to remember. It's anatomic slash zero to live FPJS workshop with dashes in between the words. Um, this has got like an overview at the start of it um, that you can read at your leisure and it, it's got all the sort of exercise and things that we're going to be going through in it too. I have got some slides to go through, but I really think the emphasis of this is going to be more around let's, let's talk through things and, and be more practical with what we're doing rather than sitting looking at pictures that I've drawn um, over the last few weeks. Uh, and I'll get my code editor open. Yeah, you probably just want to clone this whole repo down because it's got loads of code examples in as well. Uh, does everyone have Docker? Um, it's not a requirement, but it's interesting if you do. Do we have a show of hands for Docker? Okay, not too many. Ah, oh, right, okay. Not to worry, we can demonstrate without Docker. It's, it's just sort of another step that we could cover if, if needs be. And um, what's the general level of experience with JavaScript in the room? Um, people have been working on it for like a year or more, less than a year. Yeah, beginner. beginner, right back at the beginning. Occasionally touching it as it can be outdated. Okay. Coming back to it, you're coming back to it after 10 years. Okay, wow. <laughs> you could come and work on our code base because you, that's, that's how old that is. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't want to work. Our oh, JavaScript's uh, interesting in places. Um, right, okay. So I'll go through the overview and then we'll sort of get into some practical bits and pieces. So I've called it from zero to live with functional JS apps. And in my mind, the, the focus for this was... Um, less perhaps about the functional aspect uh, in terms of the programming, but more in the functional in terms of delivering something that's going to be live uh, and monitorable and have logging and all of the things that go into making something a stable production service. So um, the workshop's kind of themed around that. We're going to start by building some little bits and bobs um, getting used to working with the libraries that, I, that I've chosen to use, um, building a couple of just basic features like a, an HTTP client and some logging. And then we're gonna move into working with um, Micro, which is a, a really lightweight HTTP API um, package. And we're gonna start building an API. Probably have a little break at that point um, because there's quite a lot to, to get through to there. Uh, and then after that, we're gonna come back and look at how we can harden this app and put it into production. Um, so things like process management, um, talking about a bit, a bit about the runtime for Node, how, how we work with that, how we pass in configuration, um, how we get metrics out of our apps, and then finally, how we can protect against downstream failures in apps, um, because this is very much in a microservice kind of school of thought. So being, being cautious about how the rest of our microservice um, architecture is working is, is really important. So the things that we're going to be looking at uh, include Crox, which is a, a functional programming library by um, Ian Hoffman Hicks. Um, it's pretty good. I, I've been using it quite a bit recently, and it's really nice. Uh, other things we're looking at are Micro, PM2. I've got Jest up here because there are tests in the um, repo that you can download. I don't think we're going to go into them in too much detail, but if you do want to, then, then shout out, and we can do. And then the bottom layer is kind of our platformy stuff. So Prometheus, Hystrix, Docker, um, and there's also a bit of Toxy Proxy thrown in for good measure, but I haven't put that on here. So just want to go over kind of the, the thinking behind building these apps. So has, has anyone heard of the 12-factor app? Am I going to be covering old ground here? Okay, so, so this, is, this is kind of it. This is what we're trying to achieve now with most of the things that we're building at Skybet. Um, we want things that can be horizontally scaled easily, that can be consistent um, between environments but because the code's the same. We just pass in different config. Um, we want immutable stuff. We want share nothing architectures. Um, and we want people to be able to work in dev pretty much in the same way that they work in prod. Some of this thinking that I'm going to show you has come from patterns that have got various names, the, the clean architecture, hexagonal architecture. The hexagonal architecture is the one that I've chosen to kind of highlight here because this statement's quite, quite important. It's, it sort of shows my thinking here. And the key bit for me 
is about understanding how we can drive our applications from different um, entry points. So we're going to be building a HTTP API, but if you separate your application correctly, um, you can drive that same bit of functionality from um, a queue system, from admin scripts that you just run as one-off processes in something like Heroku. There's loads of different options. Drilling into this, the, the hexagonal architecture describes um, applications in this way, where your domain is like a business logic layer, then you've got an orchestration layer, and then outside of that, you've got your framework that provides sort of your side effective functionality. Um, kind of goes into a bit more detail here. But what I'm gonna do is kind of twist that round a little bit to fit more into how I think about these apps, which is more around how functions are composed together, how do you build app flows from your compositions using things like um, monads and, and ADTs, and then how you push the side effects of those programs right to the edges so that you can make this very testable. The applications, um, like I said before, they're gonna be um, enabling us to drive them in different ways. Um, and probably to make that a bit more real to you, this is kind of how I think about stuff. Um, I, I'm a software architect by trade, so I draw lines and boxes. If these lines and boxes are confusing, then um, please let me know because this is the stuff I work with day in, day out, and it's, it's, it's second nature to me now, but I, I appreciate that not everyone does. Um, essentially what I've done here is to sort of encapsulate what makes a service. So the blue bit at the top, if you think about that, is like where your HTTP interface is, and the green bits on the right is where you might have a message-based interface. And then the sort of orangey yellow bits in the middle are your, what I would describe as packages, that are your business logic. They're the inner rings of your application in that architecture diagram from before. Um, the, the critical thing is that this might be one repo with lots of different things in it. Um, it might be uh, multiple repos that pull in packages using NPM. So you might publish ABC to your internal NPM or the, the live NPM, and that's your business logic there. And then you can pull that into various different um, sort of edge casey apps like the HTTP part or the, um, the message-based one. Moving on from designing it, um, we're gonna sort of investigate how you know what's going on. Um, we use Grafana. This isn't actually one of our dashboards, but we use Grafana a lot. And this is a way that we can pull metrics out of our applications. Uh, to say how many requests we're handling, how long they're taking to handle, what the CPU level's like, how much disk space is left, that sort of stuff. Uh, and this is about metrics and observability. Um, and then on the other side, we've got things that scrape our logs, aggregate them, put them into tools like Splunk, where we can then go back and drill into this, this source of information about what actually happened. Um, these, these are quite interesting concepts to sort of get get your head around because um, they're quite different even though on the surface they might seem the same. So logs obviously will scale as your application scales, the volume will grow um, and they can be quite costly. But me metrics don't, they scale with the number of metrics you record. So if I'm suddenly getting millions of requests to my app, my one endpoint that says how many requests I'm receiving will just say a different number whereas my logs will be going absolutely crazy and it will make drilling into that slower. So we tend to use a, a metrics to give us a really good high level view of the health of our applications. Um, and then we use logs if we need to go back and drill into what happened to understand whether something's broken or a customer had a different experience to what we expected. Yep. Sorry, that, which tool is this for That's um, Splunk, um, but uh, we, I'm not gonna sort of go for anything. Splunk's quite expensive. So I think we're, we're actually migrating off it to the Elastic Stack. Um, which is um, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, um, which I think you can run for free if you can if you can run it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and then just to sort of there's last couple of bits before we actually dig into doing some stuff. Um, how do you handle failure? Um, one of the reasons I really like some of these functional programming techniques is because they force you to think about failure. Uh, if you ever work with a promise-based API and then you go and work with something like async or Fluture or, or, or any of those kind of um, asynchronous uh, ADTs that we might explore in the next hour or so, um, promises you're not forced to catch anything and things get swallowed up pretty badly. Whereas with an, e with an ADT, you have to be explicit. There will be an error path and you will have to handle it. Uh, a lot of the times the function signatures force you to have to handle the error before you handle the, the success value, which I, which I like, you know, it forces discipline. You fall into the pit of success with it. Um, 
Uh, and then lastly, let's think about how we protect ourselves and others. So I sort of mentioned at the start, in microservice architecture, um, you are going to be working with remote calls quite a lot of the time, um, in one way or another. Uh, and if you have a service that's particularly fundamental to several other services and it goes down, you don't really want those services hammering that with loads and loads of requests all the time because it's not going to help it get back stable. So that's where we introduced this concept of circuit breakers where it can monitor the health of the remote system that you're working with or the, or the, the database or whatever it is. Um, and if you reach a certain threshold of failure, it will open. So it will prevent any further requests going there. And then again, going back to the error handling sort of point before, that will allow you, you have the choice then to say, I'm going to handle this error in this way. Uh, you might decide to send back a cached version of what you've got. Um, you might de decide to send back nothing and just a, a 500 HTTP response. The point is you, you're in control of that and you, you, can, can, you can be dictating what the behavior should be rather than it just failing and you, you, you've got no real concept of how to get out of it. Um, so yeah, so we're going to go through all of this in much more detail. So let's build something. Um, I can put the slides on SlideShare, I think, for later, for now. Yeah, just to know how much I need to write to all of it. Oh, th these, this, there's loads and loads of documentation in the repo. Oh. So basically, this is, this is like the high-level thing. And then I've written, I'm verbose. <laughs> I've, I've, written lot, I've written lots of stuff um, in the repo to kind of make sure that people can go at their own pace. Because I'd, what I wasn't sure about was the sort of level that everyone was going to be at so some people might want to go further ahead quicker some people might want to hang back a bit and focus on something a bit more so it should all be there you um, your it's anatomic it's coming in a second don't worry um so again because i'm english and it's the world cup soon why not build a world cup app you know it's it's great um, that's what we're going to be focusing on um and if you want to get the repo that's it so if everyone wants to clone that down if anyone has any issues, let me know, uh, and then we'll, we'll get started. No, I remember the year that we didn't get in when, when Holland uh, not to start in the qualifying. It was like a, a, a year of national mourning in England. <laughs> Do people watch much soccer? Is this is this going to be something? Yeah. yeah. Cool. You've got Wayne Rooney coming over, I think. If you've ever heard of Wayne, yeah. I can't remember which team he signed for, but he he was he's leaving Everton and he's going to come over to the States. He's not even one year right? He's what? Sorry. He's not even one year at Everton, right? No. No. It's going to be expensive for whoever gets him. I think he's on some three hundred thousand pounds a week or something. Has everyone got this? Do you still need this on the on the slides? Okay, right. I'm going to open up my editor and we'll see how we go. So you can tell I work in an enterprise because I use IntelliJ. I was going to say, should we use it IntelliJ or Atom <laughs> Whatever, whatever you would like. Um, say it again, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. When you use, if uh, there's a Git ignore plugin for IntelliJ, and you say I want to, you can choose from templates, and one of them is JetBrains. You're like, okay, great, I'll choose that. But then it lets all the JetBrains stuff into your repo anyway. So I'm not entirely certain what it's cutting out there. So if everyone's got that, um, you probably just want to do an npm install in the root of the project to get everything down, or yarn install, or yarn. I use yarn, but you can. I think anything should work. And we'll get cracking on this one. Is this is this okay size-wise for everybody? So. Um, Given that we're going to be working with a remote service for the World Cup, I thought the first thing that would be interesting to look at is how we might change a promise-based interface into something that works with the async um, croc uh, from the crocs library. Um, 
So everything, you, everything in the repo should be there. I've got a source folder in there that's got the answers in. As it says at the bottom of the overview, it's up to you. Cheat if you want, but you might want to create your own source folder that's like my answers, and then you can compare the two. Um, however you want to work it, whatever you think is going to give you the most benefit. Um, so the first bit we're going to do is, is look at how we can wrap the, the Fetch API. So Fetch is a browser um, API that I've started to use more and more in Node because it means that people have got a consistent way of working with HTTP requests between browser and, and Node runtimes. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You call it with um, the minimum, as you call it, with a URL. And then that returns a promise which contains a response or it throws an error. Uh, and then you can interrogate that response for the status or if it's got a body in JSON, you can, you can call .json and get another promise, which will then hopefully resolve to something that you can then use within your application. Um, so most of the libraries that offer something like an async um, uh, croc, uh, ADT, whatever you want to call it, um, offer a very straightforward way of wrapping that. Here you can see this is just a case of wrapping fetch with this async.from promise call. And what that will mean is that the interface is pretty much exactly the same, except rather than getting a then and a catch, you to to effect this um, this this call to a remote service, you have to call dot fork, and within dot fork you have to provide an error handler and you have to provide a response handler. So um, looking at that, it might not be immediately obvious why you would use that instead of promises. The main reason. Uh, is that promises aren't lazy, so they, they evaluate eagerly. So when you, when you say do this, it will do it straight away, it, which doesn't necessarily fit too well with being able to compose things up and then run it when you want later. Um, there is a lot more information around this um, available, that, and on all of these pages in the workshop, there's further reading at the bottom that you can go and sort of dig into at your, in your own time. Um, so looking at that, we've got a basic wrapper, uh, which is with this. Um, but if we wanted to start to add new functionality to that call, for example, getting the JSON response out, uh, that's quite simple too because we can start to look at how uh, we can use little functions and compose them together with the original call to build an overall chain. Uh, so I've got this little bit of code here which is going to take the response and call res.json. This is going to return a promise and then we're just converting that uh, into an async here which I, I believe is called a natural transformation. Uh, I'm not the most um, academic with these things, but that's, that's what I've heard it referenced as. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we've got this JSON async, which is taking the response and then composing those functions together. And this is where sort of the first bit of like working in a functional way kind of fits together because this, this is okay, but it's a bit complicated to read straight through. So actually we can make it a bit more simple by using the compose operator, uh, which essentially is doing exactly what I just did there, taking a function and providing the output from another function as its input. But you can do that in a way by calling compose fg, which then produces a, the new function for you to use. So just rewriting that previous example here, um, JSON async becomes just a composition of to JSON and promise to async. Uh, if you've not worked with compose before, one of the little caveats with it is that things operate from right to left. So in this function, to JSON will be called first and the output of that will be passed to promise to async. If that doesn't fit with the way that you think, because it doesn't really make any sense, it should really be left to right, you can use pipe instead. And that just basically does the opposite. So it will be the thing on the left, then the thing on the right. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can just see how that can be composed with mfetch to, to produce this thing, this function, uh, this output, sorry, that's gonna just give you the JSON response. How's that for everyone so far? Okay. Cool. So one thing that I found, and you might have your own opinions on this, but um, there's a part of working with the Fetch API that I don't really feel is correct. Um, and that is that as long as you get a response, it says it's successful. If that response is a 500 error, I would argue that that's not successful. Um, <coughs> but, you know, that's... that's um, that's the decision of the, of the people that implemented the API. So when, when you're working with this kind of, um, this code, uh, 
you're probably going to need to put something in that validates the response that you get back to say that it's suitable for use in your application. Uh, and in this, this is where sort of the first exercise comes in. So with uh, some of the things that are already in this document uh, and, and your own code, um, let's start to look at how we might say which responses we're going to get are acceptable and which aren't. Now I've built this little um, status code checker API, which is the code for this is also in the repo if you're interested in it. Um, it's on now, so it will be asleep for the time being. It'll take a little while to wake up. Um, but what this is, is, a, is an endpoint that you can basically call with a number as the, as the first parameter, and then it will send you back a JSON body with the, with the relevant HTTP status code set. So if you just call it like this, you get a 200. If I do a 404, I'll get a 404 back. If I have internet. Uh, let's do that again. Yeah, so I get 404. And if you call it something outside of the range, um, I think 509 isn't implemented. It, so you haven't, you haven't supplied a valid status code and it will give you a 500 error. So you can use this as a bit of a playground for your, your fetch wrapper that you're going to build now to see if your validation is working or not. Okay, is everyone comfortable getting on with that? Do you want me to, I'll wander around and help if anyone's kind of a bit confused as to what we're doing and I'll put the instructions back on here. There you go, so that's, for anyone that can, can you see that okay? So that's just the vanilla thing straight off the, the markdown file. Um, so it's calling out to status code checker now at shush. Uh, and then the fork is going down the, the success branch of the async uh, and so we're getting this res status of 200 being reported out if i so if i change that to 500 it's still going to come down there we're not getting anything out of console error um, so if i was to start to think about how i might validate this we can start exploring some of the the adt interface the monadic interface and this is actually the functor part of it um, to to compose in some functionality so when you map, what you're going to get um, with this async is, is the success branch. It's not going to give you an error. So this is only going to fire if something is, is OK. In this state, that means we're going to get the response object back. And we know that that's got a status on it. Uh, and because uh, I'm not particularly... Um, because I'm not particularly keen on getting in anything above 400 as a success, we're going to start looking at how we might add some validation to that. So we're going to leave it as map for now. We'll change it in a bit. But if we say res.status um, is greater than or equal to 400 and res.status, um, is that right? Or, so yeah, I think that's right. So if it's greater than or equal to 400, um, let's send back, we don't want this. Uh, and otherwise we'll say, yeah, this is good. So to this one to 500, hopefully we should get, we don't want this, which we don't because I've done something stupid. Res, uh, now I'm just looking at the status um, here. Oh, it's because I'm trying to get that there. So I'm actually just getting our message back. Let's change that. So if we run that again, we should get, we don't want this. Um, and if I change it to a 200, we should get something we do want. Yeah, this is good, cool. Okay, so uh, with map, what you're getting with map is uh, the async is letting you reach into into the success branch and say, give me the, the thing that you've got here and then we're gonna work with it. And then it comes back out and it's wrapped in an async still. Um, if we wanted to change how this works, so rather than it coming down a success branch with a message saying, we don't want this, we want it to come back down as, a, a, as an error on the error branch, we're gonna to need to rethink this slightly um, and we're gonna use chain. Uh, what chain does is it allows us to say this thing, this function we're going to run will return another async and we're basically going to bubble it up a level. So rather than having an async of an async, we're still going to get one, but we've converted it from what we had before to the thing that's returned by this function. So in here, we're going to just look at the async and say, okay, we're going to have rejected and 
I think resolved is the other one. So these are just constructor functions that is provided by the async library. Uh, and when we don't want it, we're going to return a rejected, resjected. I've got a re Um, and then hopefully we should start to see stuff coming down the right branches. So that's coming down, it's 200, so that's coming down the success branch that's reporting out here. Um, if I change this now to be a 500, we should start to see things coming down the error branch. Okay, so it's coming down as console error. Let's just make this even more obvious. Okay, so can you, can you see the difference there? Uh, how that, how that chain function there, that chain function allows us to convert what was previously a successful response and inspect it and say, actually, is it return a rejected async, but then we can pull that up a level. So it's not gonna be a success that contains a failure. It's gonna be just the failure. Basically, yeah. It's, yeah, or flat map or whatever. I think there's different names for it. Yep. At the bottom here, in the fork bit. No, 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 <laughs> In this bit here. Oh, there, yeah, that's destructuring. Yeah, sorry. So, um, what, is, what is async like in terms of JavaScript objects, and what are the two different resolve? Um, so, they're all just functions, um, and the reject and resolve are, are constructors. They will, they will produce, they will wrap whatever you give them in either a rejected or a resolved async. Um, that's the question is, what is async in this case? What is it? Oh, it's, um, it's an ADT from the Crocs library, so it's basically just like a, a, a task monad or a future monad or something. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's all sorts. You can just, just open it up. If you yeah, yeah, that's it. A lot of this stuff is influenced by Haskell. And a lot of the type signatures will follow the sort of uh, things you'd expect to see in Haskell. Is that, that curly braces, is that an ES6 syntax in general, or is it yeah. specific? Yeah, that's, um, that's ES6, it is, it's object destructuring. Yeah, sorry. Do I? Uh, it, the is it not got a capital P? Yeah, so somebody might stumble on that. Yeah, that would be that would be a shocker. Sorry. Um, let's get that fixed. Uh, there we go. There we go. Um, yeah, so if you open up that async, uh, there's quite a lot in there. Um, but you can see the, the various sort of constructors. So from promise is a wrapper that, it doesn't create a value, it produces a function that is gonna take whatever pr uh, promise producing function underneath it and then convert the output from promise land to this async type. Um, and then you've got various other constructors. Um, rejected and resolved are just like shortcuts for making it so that it's calling the rejected error branch side or it's gonna call the success branch side, the resolve branch. Okay. Is there, is there any other parts of the syntax in here? I, I realize I'm just kind of cranking straight into ES6, but it might not be obvious to people. Are you still are you still looking for dot status on your object that's passed through? Thank you. Yeah, that's the the joy of JavaScript. Undefined is everywhere. Um, cool. So, just just to go, I, I know it's um, because we're not going to be passing this res through. Just to sort of go through this destructuring a little bit more. You can use this at the function level too. So if I um, 
say I'm going to destructure that down. I only want status. I can then use just status here. Um, if I run that, it should be exactly the same. Um, and it allows you, basically, when you get an object past or something, if you use this notation, this syntax, it will allow you to pick out the bits that you, that you want to use. Um, there's, there's lots of nice things that have been introduced in sort of more recent versions of, of JavaScript that allow you to do quite succinct function definitions like this. Um, yeah, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but I think actually overall it's a, it's a really big improvement. Right then. So we've done some validation. What was the other exercise? Oh, let's create a version of this that just fetches the JSON back. Okay. Um, so this one here, um, I'm not actually going to revert that back because I do need that response. So if I take this and get response, put res.status. Uh, let's put in here some sort of message saying we got received. Uh, invalid response and then here let's resolve it with the response we received okay so now we are going to use map if my editor will let me and this is where we can start to look at the um, how we're going to use the to JSON but I say we're going to use map we're going to use chain again sorry um, have I got an extra? Why isn't that like in that chain? No, it should be there, shouldn't it? All right, there we go. Um, so again, we're going to get this response come through, but only on success. So we're only anything that's less than a 400, so a 200 to a 210, whatever, that's going to come through this branch. Um, and now we want to try and pull out the, the JSON response from it. Um, I'm going to just do this in line here. The examples have got this separated out into functions that live outside of this flow, but for, for now this, this is fine. Um, so I'm going to rename this mfetch. No, this will be this will right for now actually, sorry. Um, and what we're going to do is say res.json, just call that. So that's going to return a promise. Okay. Um, so we need to wrap that somehow, but because we're calling it and, we, and it's, it's one of these wonderful bits of JavaScript where it needs to be .json attached to the res object. It can't just be, you can't just destructure JSON off it. Um, we're going to need to use the async constructor itself. So what this does is it takes a function, which it will call um, uh, passing in the rejected and the resolve function. So here, when we call res.json, we can just use the standard promise interface to say, if it's successful, pass it to res, and if it fails, Pass, pass it to Reg. Now, in this instance, you are likely to see catch called. The first one with mfetch, the only reason you would see um, the original fetch query fail is if you've got network errors or, or it times out or something, depending on the timeout that you set on it. Whereas this one, there's every, every chance that your JSON will be malformed or it, you don't get JSON, you might get a, a response back that's HTML. Who knows, it's the internet, things happen. Um, so it's really important that this error handling is, is done properly. If I just format that out a bit more straightforwardly, um, I'm going over it again. So we're going to pass in this standard JavaScript object, which is the response. Uh, we're going to wrap it with this async constructor, which will call res.json to try and pass the JSON. If it gets the JSON, great. We're going to resolve it to a, a resolved async and pass it through. If it fails, we're going to catch it and we're going to send it back. So hopefully now we will still... We uh, that's indeed right, yep. See, it's good that everyone, other the people are watching. <laughs> so if I change this, so obviously at that point, this, because I'm calling a 500 up here, this, this chain isn't getting called, right? Because it's this is the success path, and we're at, we're getting an error. If I change this to a 200, what we should see here at the end it, when message comes down is the original JSON response that we get from the service. Okay. 
this type of this function, you, you're in a write it once, like in your whole application. Right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously, like here, I've I've got this as like just all one thing. If we go to the example code, um, which is here, I've pulled the bits and pieces out into individual functions, which uh, in a real world application means a lot that you can you can test these. So you can each little bit can be constructed. Um, in a test suite and, and, and tested in isolation, which is which is kind of nice. Um, just in this uh, this one, it's probably worth pointing out a secondary version of compose. So, if I go back to this walkthrough here, you can see we've got we've got a bit of a pattern here of a, a chain and a chain. Now, this is similar to looking at things where you might have map called and then map, and it's sort of a bit of a code smell that you can compose those things together and just call chain once. Um, and the way I've done that in the, in the example code is using this compose k function, which is basically the, uh, I think it's the Kleisley compose. For people who are more well versed in, in this area of, of um, the, the subjects, tell me if I'm wrong or not. But um, this allows you to put two things that are going to be chainable together rather than two things that are going to be mappable, which would just be a standard um, compose function. And all this is going to do is say, I've got this pass function here. Uh, I'm using an if-else helper to say if it's valid, then we're going to try and pass it, and if not, we're going to try and pass it and then reject it. Okay. How's that looking? Is that clear to everyone? Is anyone wildly confused? Anyone think this is way too simple and we should be going faster? Not wildly, but in the, um, in the other part, the wrapping in, the wrapping in the this bit. Is it this this bit that you're? Um, it's just it's just. Um, th it's, it's basically allowing us to change it from, to, to handle the failure and to convert it to a rejected version. It's the main thing. So if, if we were just, if, it, if we knew it could just always work, you would probably just map over the inner value and convert it in one way or another. But because this call to dot JSON um, so in, in the promise world. Fail, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So, and yeah. It's just a way to say, like, this is, this is, if you pull it out into its own function, say, um, it would be, it'd be more obvious that we want, it's just the same as we were doing in the original fetch call. We're converting from a promise API to the, the monadic API that async provides. Yeah, I think in this, in the original version, the only thing I did extra was to say, we don't want anything less than a 200, but, you know, that, I don't think that really matters too much. Great. Everyone comfortable with where we've got to with that so far? Okay, cool. So, um, let's move on to logging. So, if you are into the, the pure, functional, highly um, regulated world that, that Haskell offers, um, this is JavaScript, we're going to have to be a bit more pragmatic. Uh, we are going to be embracing our old friend console log, but in a safe way, hopefully. Um, in a 12-factor app, the thing, the thing that is important is that you just emit your log as a stream of events on standard out. Uh, you, you're not worried about writing to file, you're not thinking about anything about log rotation, etc. That's That's for the, the thing that's running your app to control. Okay, so makes this a lot simpler for us really because we can just write this log function, this really straightforward thing to just dump stuff out on console log uh, and then we can move on and, and think about that as a different part of our architecture. Uh, some things to touch on um, is thinking about how you're going to represent the severity of an event. So uh, this is from the syslog protocol. It's something that I think most 
logging, decent logging uh, packages you'll get from NPM will follow. Uh, and it's basically just assigning like a, a, a level of importance to something so that in different environments you can set your logging level to say, right, I'm in production, show me notice and above. Um, or if I'm running it locally, you might literally want everything. You want to, you, you'll have instrumented the whole of your code with as much logging as you could possibly fit in there so you can really get into the, the depths of what's going on. The reason we're going to write this is to just explore how we can do log formatting. Um, the common log format is what you'd see coming out of things like Apache. Um, I personally prefer to log everything out as JSON because it makes it easier to scrape. Um, there is an argument that it's less human readable, but you can just pipe it through something like JQ or JSONPP. The, the, it's not that bad, and I actually think that the benefits outweigh the negatives. Um, the only thing to bear in mind with it when you are logging stuff out as JSON is that it has to be, it's, it's best if it's on one line because it makes scraping it much, much easier. If you've got multiple line logs, um, it can be a bit of a nightmare to work with. Um, Crocs as a, as a library is really good for being pragmatic in this area. So they provide this wrapping function called tap. And essentially what that gives you is a way to say, uh, wrap this thing that's going to do some sort of side effect um, in a function that will always just return the thing that was passed into it. So there is some discipline needed. If you write your logging thing that takes an object and you start to like change properties on that object, yeah, you're going to be returning something that's been mutated. So you're going to have to have some discipline in this too. But this tap is kind of a nice way that you can kind of look at your program flows. Like in the previous thing uh, we wrote with the HTTP client, you might put a map in there and, and tap the console log just so you can see what's coming through it. And as long as you're not changing anything, it's like it's not there. You're kind of just getting away with it. It's pragmatic. We'll leave it at that. And you can see how that kind of works down here. So if I've got um, this idea of an array of values and I map and just wrap console up with tap, um, it will log out a line per value in the array and then just return me the original array that I passed in. So yeah, really, really useful way of working to, um, to, to get some information out of your application and into, I don't know, Elk, whatever, Splunk. Um, so the reason this is in here is because it isn't just as straightforward as logging a line out. Um, I think it's really valuable, if I go back up here, I think it's really valuable to think about what it is that's going to help you, help your future self when you're debugging these applications, get to the bottom of what's going on. And the, th the actual output that you log is a small part of that. Knowing about the environment it's running in, like here I've got process ID, the parent process ID, what platform it is, the timestamp it happened at, and then a, a date time, um, what level it was, etc. And then there's the body of the log. Um, that will help you to debug and investigate stuff later on. Okay, so uh, the reason this is in here, hopefully it's a fairly quick one. I just want you to build a very straightforward logger that's going to provide you a means of saying this is of level notice, this is of level error, this is of level warning, or whatever you determine. Uh, here's the body, and then it spits stuff out in JSON format to the to the standard out, um, and you can just see it there. Okay. We, we won't spend too long on this one because it should hopefully be fairly quick. Again, there's an example of implementation, um, and if you get this done really quickly, you can start to play around with adding color to your log lines because colors are nice. So everyone, everyone managed to get something basic logging out in JSON format with some extra bits and pieces in there. Yeah. It's fairly straightforward. Have you got log levels in? I'll take that as a yes. Okay. So... I guess it's most basic because we can wrap this with tap when we use it. I'm going to just set up a thing that says given a level and a value. Um, I'm going to create an object which says what the level is. And then I'm going to say the body of that is the value. Um, and I don't know, called PID is process.pid. Um, let's, I don't know, leave it at that for now. <laughs>